Hi folks, tool run out. Let's talk about what it is, why it's important to adjust, and then let's put it to the test. If we take a tool with bad run out, and if we adjust the run out on that tool by tapping it or dilating it in, does it stick? Does it last even after we've put that tool through a cutting operation? Welcome to another Wednesday widget. So what is run out? Run out means the cutting edges of your flute aren't on axis with the center line of your spindle. You may have heard that common phrase TIR. TIR actually stands for total indicated reading, which is the reading of an indicator measuring the heights of those cutting flutes as it rotates around. And run out really matters because you've got to have even cutting flutes to get a good surface finish to get an accurate part. And when you have differences in those cutting flutes or run out, it can lead to chatter and reduced tool life. Alex helped out on this project. He created a file infusion, used the sculpt environment, and it's a mirrored part. So it'll give us the chance to compare the left and the right side. On the left side, we're going to run it with what we consider bad run out. And then the exact same tool with the run out adjusted, the exact same tool path, we'll run the right side and we'll take a look to see, can we see a difference? Roughing the part in before we do our surfacing, we'll post this F3D file over on the NYC CNC website. We're using a bull nose end mill quarter inch tool with a 30 thou rad on the Tormach 770. Starting with a 3D adaptive to hog out most of that material. Then we're switching over to a 3D parallel tool path to do a secondary roughing. All throughout here, we're leaving a specific amount of stock to leave. Then we're doing a semi roughing with a true ball nose end mill. Again, leaving some amount of stock to leave before we finally get to our run out test. It's important for this test that we spent the time to do the roughing and the semi roughing strategies because I wanted to make sure when we started our actual finishing operation, we weren't left with a stair stepped or water lined roughing strategy like you would see here because as the tool would move across, it would have different amounts of tool pressure, which would lead to deflection and dramatically influence the cut results. And even though this is just an aluminum part and we're using a carbide tool, all materials deflect, even carbide in a relatively soft or free cutting material like aluminum. And in this case, our final surfacing is being done with a 3 64ths end mill. That's about 40 thousandths of an inch or just over one millimeter. And it's important to think about total indicated reading or your tool run out relative to its diameter. The smaller the tool, the more you want to focus on having low run out. Most of the seasoned machinists I talk to really want to see it under three ten thousandths of an inch or even a little bit less than that. When you're doing roughing strategies or you're using larger diameter tools, there's less sensitivity to run out, partly because the tools can take the abuse. On these small end mills, when you have a relatively low feed per tooth, like in this example, one thousandth of an inch, if you had seven tenths run out, and let's say, for example, it's a two flute tool, that's not an uncommon TIR to see. And the problem may not come from the cutting tool itself. It could come from the spindle, the tool holder, the collet, the collet nut. There's a whole stack of things that can lead to the problem or be part of the solution. Speaking about that stack of tolerances, let's talk a little bit about how an end mill is made. Card here, by the, when we had the chance to tour the helical facility, the end mills may not be made how you think. And this varies by tool or by manufacturer and so forth. But most of the time, a carbide end mill had started out somewhere actually as a powder. That powder is pressed into a blank size. So for a quarter inch tool, maybe a quarter inch diameter with two or three inch overall length. And then it's sintered down to size. They may be sort of pre-ground as well. That usually is done by a company upstream of the cutting tool company. So they buy those blanks. The blanks come in. An end mill may be ground on one, two, or even three different machines. Oftentimes the shank of the tool is already on size, so it's not ground by the company. Sometimes the whole tool is ground in one operation, but sometimes that taper is ground on a separate machine and then the tool's moved over and then the rest of it's ground out or there may be two separate grinding processes or grinding machines. So as you can imagine, every time that tool is set up, there's the chance for there to be error induced. Now, cutting tool companies are very good at what they do. And generally speaking, you shouldn't have an issue, but it's worth knowing that just because you have a carbide end mill or just because it happened to be an expensive carbide end mill doesn't always mean everything is perfect. It also means if you check the run out on the shank or even the taper, 
there's a chance it doesn't match the runout at the cutting flute, which is the runout that we actually care about. We use our Speroni presetter to measure the runout at first. The Speroni has different macro settings that let you adjust what exactly you're looking for. Here we're using what's called Macro 33, which picks a specific point on the tool. We then rotate the tool 180 degrees and we look at the deviation or change in value. And here we got seven ten thousandths of an inch, which is quite a bit of run out and more than I would like to see, especially on a tool this small, which is perfect for our first test, which is to run the quote unquote bad side. Now let's see if we can improve the indicated reading or the run out of that tool. And we're going to do it with a way that you may not agree with, but let's test it. We're going to use a flat bladed screwdriver with some electrical tape over the end just to avoid metal on metal contact. And we're going to tap that tool inside the ER collet. There are other ways to do this. You can try adjusting the tool inside the collet. You can adjust the collet inside the nut. You can switch nuts. You can rotate the whole tool in the spindle. There's lots of different ways you can skin it. I happen to like this method. You don't have to tap very hard. You'll be able to see some changes or differences. I prefer to do this with the indicator needle touching the shank of the tool so that you can see the, the impact you're making. Some people will prefer to remove the indicator so that you're not potentially transferring some force or shock through that. I have not seen it be a problem, but depends. As you can clearly see here, we have a tense indicator that is for general purpose shop use, not for true metrology use. It's a lot easier to check the runout on the shank because it's a continuous surface. So we dial that in first, then we'll move, then we'll move the indicator needle down and rotate the tool backward to look for the high spot on each of those two flutes. If you're really struggling to do this, you can use the shank of the indicator needle instead of the tip of the ball and just have that shank tangentially touching. It could be a lot easier to do this. Just recognize that the readings you get will no longer be correct because you're contacting the tip at a different location. We got this down to within two tenths, that's great. It's best to not remove the tool holder from the spindle if you have to. Be sure to reinsert the tool at the same orientation so you can clock it by making a mark with a Sharpie. Some people actually leave a permanent mark on their machine so they always put the tools in. We ran the corrected side, and at first glance, the tool paths both really look pretty good. I was hoping that we would see something more drastic and prove that even seven tenths runout can have a catastrophic effect on your surface finish. But here's the thing. If you put this under the microscope, you actually can see a bit of difference. This didn't come through as well as I'd hoped on video, but the left side had more pockmarked and gouging, which is what I would expect to see. On the right side, you had more straight, even rows that I would expect to see from a correctly aligned tool as it moves across the parallel tool path with its feed forward marks. We took a look at the tools under a microscope to see if there was any issues with wear. And the problem here is aluminum isn't the right material to do this test. There is no question. There have been numerous studies published and shown that as you're moving into steel cutting tools or certainly things like stainless or exotic alloys that where your tool life may go from 100 hours in aluminum to 30 or 60 minutes in something like titanium, that run out has a more direct impact on tool life. But finally, the thing I was most excited to test is, did it stay? This question came up when we did the Bazooka Lego mold some time ago. We had dialed in the run out, but does that stay? Does tapping in that tool with a hammer result in a permanent fix or just a temporary fix that's quickly negated as soon as the tool starts cutting and the tool pressure or contact the workpiece causes it to reset back to its low setting? In our tests, it has stayed. We encourage you, test this out yourself. Let us know in the comments below what tips and tricks you have for this. There's no question that as you move up the food chain with higher quality machine tools, higher quality cutting tools, you need to match that with high quality collets, high quality holders, and you need to check runout. Don't make assumptions. With our new Speeds and Feeds project, we're checking runout all the time, which is why we ended up going with the Speroni. It's so much easier to check it with that machine in a non-contact way, very quick, very efficient, very accurate, versus having to use indicators and align it up. The difference, of course, is that checking on the Speroni tells you the runout stack within that tool holder that can still change depending on how the tool holder is mounted in your spindle. So folks, I hope you found this educational. Hope you learned something. Take care. See you soon.